So greetings to everyone. Good morning and good evening. Maybe some of our speakers are in, have just woke up. So good morning and good evening, everyone. So we are ready to start our training. And my name is Oren Stig. I am a member of Mongolian Evaluation Association and co-founder of Evaluate Mongolia. And so for the next three days, I will be working as a training moderator. And let me introduce our organizing team, Mr. Tukultur, Mr. Silpatam, and Ms. Urin Tashman. Our team will help you during the training session. So if you have any technical problems, please write in the chat and our team will help you. So um, briefly introducing, this, is, uh, this training is one of our four activities that we are organizing in Mongolia as part of the global campaign, Youth in Evaluation Youth. So our activities aims to raise awareness, build capacity, and educate about evaluation in Mongolia, and, and, and also promote meaningful young, young youth engagement in the evaluation. So for the next three days, we will have a total of six sessions, and we are partnering with alumni team of American University's Measurement and Evaluation Program. So I hope you all get the best out of this training session and yeah, please enjoy our training. So before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to remind that we will have a photo shoot session with our speakers and teachers right after each session. So please change your um, Zoom background with the campaign's photo. The photo is uh, previously sent by email to you guys and also uploaded in the chat right now. Yeah, and all right. So now please welcome our speakers for the opening session. Today we have Dr. Halid Sharifi, who is the head of uh, Office of United Nations Population Fund Mongolia. So over to you, Dr. Helen. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's our uh, my great honor to speak uh, with all the young evaluators in this uh, evening. Uh, it's important to talk about the youth engagement and uh, evaluation and youth uh, in evaluation week. Uh, Evaluation is critical for the global and national humanitarian and development agenda. Uh, the government of Mongolia uh, is committed to global uh, initiatives such as the International Conference on uh, Population and Development and the Sustainable Development Goals, including the SDG 3 and SDG 5, which are the key priorities for UNFPA uh, at the global, also at the country level. And the aim of all these uh, global initiatives are to improve people's well-being and livelihood of people worldwide. Uh, at the same time, uh, Mongolia uh, developed a vision for 2050, which is the strategic direction for the long-term development of Mongolia. And that shapes the policies, the strategies, and programs in uh, Mongolia. Evaluation plays a critical role in uh, progress of UNFPA Mongolia seven country program, which is the three transformative results, zero preventable maternal deaths, zero unmet need for family planning, and zero gender-based violence and harmful practices. Therefore, evaluation is crucial for global initiatives and Mongolia vision for 2050 to measure the progress, identify success and challenges and inform future action. However, evaluation is often seen as a domain of experts and professionals and young people are frequently excluded from this conversation. Engaging young people in evaluation is also essential for several reasons. We can say first, young people bring fresh perspective uh, 
and innovative ideas to the field of evaluation. Second, young people are often the target population of program and policies being evaluated. Therefore, their insight and feedback are critical in assessing the effectiveness and relevance of these initiatives. Third, engaging young people in evaluation can help build a more diverse, inclusive evaluation community. Fourth, involving young people in evaluation can help build their skills and knowledge in this field. And finally, engaging young people in evaluation can help build a culture of accountability, transparency, and program and policies that affect the young population. In summary, we can say that engaging young people in evaluation is critical for promoting innovation, building a more diverse uh, and inclusive evaluation community, building skills, knowledge, promoting accountability, transparency, and program and policies that affect young people. UNIFI's co-lead of uh, evaluation for action campaign to accelerate the achievements of sustainable development goal. At the country level, UNIFI country offices promoting engagement of young and emerging evaluators in evaluations to promote the importance of evaluation to achieve sustainable development goal. And I think this training is a, a good opportunity for uh, young uh, uh, generation who are interested to build their career uh, in evaluation. It will uh, provide a very basic uh, uh, about evaluation and how you're going to build your career. I wish you all the very best and success in your uh, three days training. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Haji. We are very honored to have you today. So um, now let's please welcome our next speaker, who is um, Ms. Mokchimuk, uh, our co-founder and Ivalius Mongolia. Over to you, Mokchimuk. Good evening, greetings from Mongolia, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts through the opening remarks. Um, as, uh, as said by Ola, I am the co-founder and co-leader for the Evalius Mongolia. And we, uh, as a team, we are, are organizing four events. And I'm also one of the, um, uh, to say, in charge of the organizing manifesto and standard. So I'd like to briefly introduce what is this event is about. And I'd like to show, can I share my screen? I think I can share it, right? Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is the uh, manifesto. And uh, so as the Togutor and other interns, I also have interns in my team. And my interns... Um, uh, contributed and helped the values and also the at the global level to um, develop the communication and vis visibility materials and etc etc and translation of the standards for example so I'd like to share the um, manifesto posters that our interns have designed so this is about the manifesto manifesto is about to um, advocate and promote the importance and meaningfulness, meaningfulness of youth in the evaluation sector. And in a Mongolian context, uh, we reached out more than 40 organizations so far, and we also reached UNFPA Mongolia, and we had a meeting yesterday, and Dr. Halid and FIA Mongolia team uh, kindly accepted our um, request and also uh, showed their support by signing the manifesto yesterday. And this is the also a poster about the standards. Also, I'd like to share the picture of our uh, manifesto and meeting um, photos. 
And this is also just an uh, information. This is the how the manifesto looks like. So it was shared uh, with global team in English and our interns uh, translated into Mongolian. So we also reviewed the versions. And uh, also I'd like to, I'm very proud and happy to share our first pitch video, which is also recorded by our interns. And I would like to share the video with you guys. You will be the first um, viewers of this video. Humans are still struggling with the cross. Can you can you hear the sound? Mm -hmm. We can. Okay. It's cutting social, economic, and environmental issues such as women rights conflict, poverty, unemployment, and social inequality, and also energy and sustainability. It required joint efforts and actions from us on regional, national, and global levels in the leadership field. In order to achieve sustainable development goals, it's crucial for intergenerational collaboration to build inclusive, equitable, and sustainable future for all. Youths not only represent the future of the country, but they are also one of the society's main agents for change and progress. So evaluation is considered a way for uh, united and coordinated uh, action with youths. It is time to make ambitious with uh, ambitious actions for meaningful youth engagement in the evaluation field. We should provide equal opportunity for youth to leverage their knowledge and experience for a better world. Youth in Evolution invites individuals, institutions throughout Manifesto. Accept us. Recognize us. Include us. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you for the emojis on the chat as well. And I will share the, um, uh, your responses with our team. And uh, I would also like to inform the participants in this capacity building training to join our manifesto by signing. And then it's not only just the signing uh, activity, it's also it's a opportunity to join the global network and get more insights about the what is going on in at the global level and in Mongolia as well. So I will share the uh, link in the chat. And if you don't mind, I will let also Ora uh, that she can share the contact information with me so I can sign it for you. Thank you so much. And I hope you enjoy the training. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dimitri. Thank you. Yeah, so I will share our um, participants' contact with you, and our participants can yeah sign. So please note that you can sign individually, individually, and by your organization as well. So um, this will express that uh, you are like promoting the uh, and taking the action to for the meaningful engagement of youth in evaluation. Okay, so let's move to our next session. Actually, it's our main session. So to briefly introduce our agenda, we will have two sessions today. Uh, the first session is uh, introduction to evaluation and the second session is logic model development. And, um, and I, 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 I'd like to thank our speakers also like for their encouraging words and it's our honor to have them here with us. So I'm um, moving to our main session. Um, I'd like to welcome Ms. Erdin Chimik, who is uh, president and founder of Mongolian Evaluation Association and also who is a great support of our youth team. She will present our first session. So. Um, before moving to the sessions, I'd like to ask you guys that if you have any questions during the presentation, you can uh, use chat to feature the your questions. And also after two sessions, we will have 
Q&A session, so you can ask directly there. Okay, over to you, Mr. Njimik. Thank you very much, Orna, and all the valued and in our interns for this great opportunity for me to participate. Uh, if I may, or uh, before I jump into my uh, today's learning, uh, learning <laughs> uh, sharing, I would like to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Beverly Peters. She is with us uh, on the call, and because she is the um, uh, she is the uh, she's from American University, and we had the uh, MOU signing yesterday after almost like six months of process with between Mon Mongolian Evaluation Association and uh, American University. So I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Peters uh, to uh, have some words for us and maybe share what that MOU is, is about. And um, yes, if over to you, Dr. Peters. She she is with us, right? I saw how she was <laughs> earlier. Maybe uh, for some sometimes she um, jumped out. If she uh, joins, and then maybe after my session, I I would like still uh, to introduce her to the participants. Well, okay. So let's then start. Ora, you can share my presentation, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so uh, today I would like to just give you a very, um, uh, very basic introduction to evaluation because you will have a great chance to learn from American University students and alumni on the uh, um, parts and parcels of evaluation. Uh, before I uh, start the presentation, I would like to acknowledge that this presentation is based on the, uh, um, the teaching and the co-program we had with the Washington Evaluators, our company Cognos International in 2021. So it was during before, before the uh, establishment of Mongolian Evaluation Association our company had some connection with the Washington evaluators uh, in the scope of the um, evaluation without borders. So we had two learning sessions for our company uh, researchers and evaluators. So this is from that slide. So I'd like to acknowledge that before. Okay, next slide. So, uh, Today, I would like to cover these three areas. What's really the evaluation and what's the purpose and core principles of evaluation and what kind of evaluation we are talking about. And secondly, uh, what is the components of evaluation process from beginning from the design of it and evaluation question and data collection and analyzing the data and reporting. And lastly, if time allows, I will talk quickly about ethical considerations for evaluation. Next. So uh, um, now we hear a lot this word nowadays and even before uh, during communism, we uh, heard a lot about monitoring. It's an almost like auditing or um, compliance. So we are quite familiar with the term monitoring. It's in more like an ongoing systematic uh, gathering of data for that specific project or program. So it involves indicators and milestones. Whereas evaluation, the term we are talking these uh, days, sorry, I need to tell my daughter to a little bit quiet. Actually, I'm the same, but behind me, it's a funny, find <laughs> it funny. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so the evaluation we've been talking this week is, it's a um, systematic collection and analysis of information about the characteristics and outcome of programs or policies 
to inform the decisions uh, and about the current and future programs. So uh, it is uh, not in uh, monitoring, but it's a more like an uh, overarching and the long-term process of involving monitoring itself. And the important thing is it's never that we do the evaluation it's, uh, alone and uh, it's a collaborative effort um, and it should never be punitive. Uh, because whenever people think, oh, evaluation team is coming, they would think somebody is going to check us or going to uh, uh, say, okay, this is wrong or that's wrong. Why have you done something like that? But it's more like we want to help the, uh, help the other party to, to show them that what's, what they need to scale up or what they need to stop doing for the sake of more effectiveness and efficiency, sustainability of the um, outcome they are thinking about. So um, another important thing is evaluation is not valuation. So it's uh, with E, but valuation is more like a financial valuation or asset valuation. In Mongolia, we are quite fami familiar as well with the valuation, the word valuation appraisers, valuation, financial valuations, but it is not that we are talking about today. Okay, next. So uh, um, now I want to just briefly touch on what kind of evaluation we have um, uh, in the world of evaluation. So classic definition, uh, classic types of evaluation is formative evaluation and summative evaluation. So we can see the word formative itself is as self-explanatory. So this is a during the formation of uh, the project or policy program ongoing. So, uh, but summative is when the a project or policy program is quite in the mature level or, or quite an established uh, stage. Um, and then uh, based on which um, stage of the program, so we decide which, whether the program should be, the evaluation should be formative or summative. So based on that decision now, the next step is we ask, um, what kind of evaluation then we uh, employ? Is it needs assessment or process or implementation evaluation? If these are the two ones, then the, this is a formative one. And if it's more like a summative one, uh, then we employ outcome or impact type of evaluations. And based on this type of evaluation, we ask different questions. So you can see, for example, during uh, for the formative evaluation, we ask, to what extent is the need being met? What can be done to address the need? Or like if it's a new program, um, and then we employ in the process evaluation, we ask, is the program operating as planned? Or is there any course correction needed? So this gives an opportunity for the uh, client or the program uh, officers to, uh, to change and revise the program while it's being implemented. So if we look at the questions for the summative ones, uh, we ask questions like, is the program achieving its objectives? Or what predicted and unpredicted impacts has the program had? So you can see, um, based on the stage of the program or policy, we decide which type of evaluation we have to employ and what kind of uh, evaluation questions then um, consequently we ask. So that's the very um, number one uh, evaluative thinking we should have when we start evaluation. Okay, next. And um, so uh, as an evaluator, we have to have these kind of principles for ourselves. Uh, and also evaluation itself has to have some principles because we don't want our evaluation report be it one of those dusted reports who nobody reads after it's published or uploaded on the website, right? So our evaluation should be very utilization focused. So we have this utilization focused evaluation uh, whose founder is Michael, Dr. Michael Quinn Patton. And he spoke at our learning session in February. So I, what, I would like to encourage you to go to YouTube or our Facebook page 
and uh, watch his uh, presentation uh, that gave uh, a cessation. So he is the founder of utilization focused evaluation. And next uh, principle is we have to be very um, be aware of our scope because usually all the evaluation uh, in the TOR, they say the scope of the evaluation is this. However, when we start uh, developing our evaluation question and go into the field, then suddenly we are overwhelmed with lots of good ideas or that if you feel like I want to change the world, right? So we tend to uh, lose our focus and suddenly we are ran out of our time or a resource. So we have to be always cognizant of whether the question, the evaluation question and data collection, is it serving our first purpose of the evaluation? So always have to revisit to the first evaluation purpose question. And then rigor. Rigor is something like our um, evaluation uh, design and method should be uh, scientifically uh, uh, scientifically informed and it has to have some good backup of uh, methodology. Uh, it should not be like a based on the rumors or based on only few people's facts. So this should be backed up by scientific methods. And another principle we have is mixed method. So because it's not a research or it's only um, not an RCT. So we have to, we should aim to employ both quantitative and qualitative methods when we uh, design and gather our data. Uh, usually quantitative methods that we can apply survey or we can do some RCTs, but still we have to uh, have some key informant interviews, Fox group discussions to triangulate our data and to uh, answer to the questions why. And lastly, um, it's very important to engage and respect our stakeholders, whether it is a beneficiary or uh, the, whether it's a donor or the implementing partner, they should all be equally treated and respected. Um, yes. All right, so next slide. Um, here you see six steps of conducting evaluation from its inception to the submission of the report. So um, firstly, um, you can see this process is very logical, yeah? So we'll go to um, all of this in a more detail later, but briefly, if I say, uh, first, we need to determine who the evaluation is going to matter or to affect, whether they should be engaged, and if so, how. So you can see that although stakeholder identification is listed first, in reality, it might be something that evolves throughout the evaluation. For example, it's safe to assume that program participants are going to be stakeholders, but when you go to the step number two, three, and four, the other key groups or people might emerge during the evaluation. And next, unless it's a needs assessment or formative evaluation, we need to understand what the program set out to achieve and its underlying design components. So the evaluation can look at how well the program is working. And thirdly, all the evaluations need a set of questions that the evaluation seeks to answer. And once the path is set with the questions, we collect data using methods and rigor appropriate for the questions and the intended use of the data. Then based on the data and evidence we have gathered, we develop findings, conclusions, and recommendations parts. Then lastly, we must document our methods, findings, conclusions, recommendations, and communicate them to all relevant stakeholders, or at least be sure they are accessible to relevant stakeholders. You know, uh, we have to always remember that evaluations are intended to be used to inform actions or decisions about programs or policies. Okay, next. Um, so the first step, uh, as we, I have just briefly mentioned, it's an identifying and engaging stakeholders. So evaluators, as evaluators, we need to balance maintaining independence, which helps ensure they can provide objective data collection and analysis, 
while also considering their operational realities and taking into account the opinion of those who are affected by the program or by the results of the evaluation. So um, we should ask these questions, who needs to be involved? Why do they need to be involved? When do they need to be involved? How or what level should they be involved? So um, from the very beginning, we usually come up with a stakeholder list, stakeholder mapping in order to uh, uh, inform our key evaluation questions and later on the data collection stage. Next. So next is uh, basically it's saying uh, we have to do our homework. So let's imagine that we you are uh, contracted as an evaluator. And first thing is you come up with the list of the stakeholders or mapping. And then now you want to uh, dig yourself into the literature review or desktop review, right? So you read all the project or program documents, monitoring reports, and government and national service, other reports in that field, and other primary and secondary data from the National Statistics Office or other service. And um, also we can, uh, our, my next speaker, speaker will talk about logic models, so I will not touch on this, but uh, if the program or project uh, policy does not have any pro uh, pro logic model, as an evaluator, we can help that client to create one because it helps the um, organization to track their progress and to be accountable at the end of the project or program. So it's very good practice if if an organization has one. And next. <clears throat> so next is uh, we have to then um, define our evaluation questions. Uh, so evaluation questions are usually informed by our um, project documents and project or policy program objectives and who are the stakeholders, etc. So these are, uh, if you, you go to the next one, uh, these can be evaluation questions can be informed by the OCT DAC criteria. Uh, so many of you might have heard it or not have heard it, but you will encounter this criteria many times when you do the evaluation. Um, so uh, it used to have five criteria, but um, last year they added the criteria of coherence, that blue one, because oftentimes many donors or many organizations, they uh, exhaust their resources without um, maybe called, like complementing their uh, efforts for the one vision or for the one goal. So here and there's the different um, interventions but with the one goal they want to address. So uh, in order to uh, in, 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 in manifest the, or increase the impact of intervention, it's often now in, encouraged to uh, integrate the effort. So that's the coherence indicator they are talking about. So uh, OCT criteria, uh, these quest criteria uh, are very helpful to design our evaluation questions. So firstly, usually it starts with the relevance. Is the intervention doing the right thing in, in your country? For example, uh, we talked about um, child money, right? So giving child mon money every month, is it helping to reduce the stunting in your country or is it helping the household um, in terms of financing, uh, like a, in terms of uh, daily intake of food, something like that. So we look at the project intervention with the um, national um, priorities and other documents like we have STV Sustainable Development 2050 and SDG 2030, etc. And then um, also we look at um, if effectiveness. Effectiveness is uh, basically answering to the question, is the intervention achieving the, its objectives? And efficiency, how well are the resources used? And um, also another uh, indicator is sustainability. Will the benefits last after donors leave 
uh, the country or they stop funding your project. So the sustainability is it insured during the process of project lifetime. And then we have impact. What difference is the intervention making? So usually impact uh, is measured, uh, evaluated after three to five years, because it's a very high level impact, um, not really uh, ready to be observed right after the project or program ends. So these are very informative uh, tools that uh, evaluators use. And I would like to encourage you <clears throat> to explore also just uh, type in OCD that criteria and you would look at uh, you would uh, look at this and our Mongolian evaluation association is uh, going to translate this um, evaluation criteria brochure uh, uh, with the permission and then endorsement from OECD so we are excited about it um, yes okay so next slide Next stage is collecting data. So now we have um, the evaluation question, evaluation design and question. Uh, we have reviewed all the documents and now we, the exciting time is going to the field and collecting the data using um, the evaluation questions. We call it a data collection instrument. So um, in the field, we, um, uh, meet many different types of stakeholders. They can be beneficiaries or primary, secondary beneficiaries, or even sometimes children. Or So these are many types of people we uh, collect data from. And also uh, the data can be quantitative. Uh, we sometimes uh, use, um, we do a survey to collect some primary data, but also we can um, extract some Nowadays, we're talking about big data and social media data and how to, um, like during COVID, uh, many of the evaluation were done using uh, social media channel, social media data and some GIS um, censorship. So nowadays, um, data is collected using many different types of tools and recently, uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they've been in touch with us last few weeks um, saying we would like to uh, connect with MEA and introduce our AI, AI artificial intelligence tools, have to uh, collect data and have to interpret and analyze. So we are excited about it. And our valued uh, Mongolia chapter uh, colleagues will inform you guys uh, about those sessions. So I'd like to invite you to those MIT AI session as well. So data collection is now quite exciting. We use many different uh, technological tools. All right, uh, next one is uh, evaluation data metrics. So this is a very simple and useful matrix you can use. So uh, in the first column, you uh, have this evaluation question. So for example, EQ1 can be about your relevance question. So how relevant is your program uh, compared to the national priority of Mongolia, uh, specifically maybe um, children's health, right? And then you break down that big question to the sub questions. So that's how you uh, include at least the evaluation questions in the column. And secondly, second uh, column is how you're going to then um, get those information from whom? So it can be key informant or focus group discussion or program participants, stakeholders, third party uh, data. So you specify how you're going to uh, answer for that question um, from whom. And then um, the next column is what kind of information you're going to collect, right? Uh, which kind of uh, method you're going to employ for that key informant, survey, site visit, Fox group, document review, statistical analysis. So um, this is a very basic one, but for every evaluation, you as a group, as a team, come up with that uh, table and you add more columns. Um, like for me, how I do is, 
uh, first column is evaluation question. And, and then horizontally, I uh, put like KI, um, KI by hunger, I make the KI, UB, KI, uh, government get so I uh, first few columns would be all chaos with different locations and um, but Fox group discussion will be analyzed in different metrics so uh, each evaluator or each evaluation team can team can up with their own method next um, so uh, uh, now you have your data, put in, in, entry it into your metrics, and you now analyze it. Yeah. So um, usually, we um, in my case, I do three level analysis. The first level is you put all the data into that matrix, and second level is you uh, summarize uh, the data, enter it into the matrix with the same um, information information resource. So for example, what are the, all the key informants answered to the evaluation question 1.1? So I summarize, and then you can see some thematic uh, or some um, like some content analysis or some thematic some thematic things can come up with those from those summary. And third level analysis, you review all the resource sources of information with the ski informant the Fox group or documents, and you triangulate everything and then come up with the third level analysis. So that's how I do, but uh, other teams, other evaluators can come up with different uh, their own approaches. So now you have the findings. That's findings is after the third level analysis, and then uh, another, the second, the next level is conclusion. So conclusion represents the evaluator's analysis of what the facts tell us about the program in relation to the evaluation questions. Sometimes combined with the findings to streamline. Yes. So sometimes uh, you do not see the conclusion part. It's on the findings, then jump to recommendations. So it's really your call or sometimes client's uh, requirement. And then, but recommendation part is must because evaluation is all about recommendation, whether to scale up the program or drop that intervention. Um, and uh, so uh, besides recommendation, I, what I like uh, is lessons learned. So. What are the lessons learned throughout this process of evaluation or throughout the implementation of this project? Usually that's uh, very helpful for the clients and the donors uh, to reflect about their intervention. Maybe they are not really uh, in the evaluation questions per se, but during the evaluation you are doing, you will observe, observe and then you have you document it and then you put it in a frame of frame uh, framework of evaluate, uh, lessons learned. And the last slide we have um, report, communicate, and disseminate. So um, usually the evaluation report has these um, outlines: executive summary, uh, then methodology analysis part, then findings, conclusion, recommendation. And sometimes also, not sometimes, it's always uh, there that limitations because there's always limitation because we do not have all the resources or human resources, financial resources. So it's good practice that we be honest and document what were the limitations from the very beginning. For example, our company last year we did a, a homeless uh, homeless situation of Mongo Lambatar city and then the main limitations were it's it's not a census or it's not a representative survey because we do not have the uh, framework of humming all the uh, homeless population so we did the convenience sampling so being honest about your own uh, limitation and putting that into the report is very good practice as well. Be, 
do not be shy, do not be perfectionist, <laughs> just to put it there, because it helps uh, also to cover many other questions people have in their mind uh, the, for the readers. And um, <clears throat> uh, the last thing I want to say is um, usually until recent, Evaluation research, evaluation and research reports been hundreds of page, pages. And but what I'm now very uh, in favor of is that um, make it as short as possible. Sometimes I think some organizations they have limited like 25 pages at max. <laughs> so you have really distilled it down. And then for me, I like to put some infographics, uh, create some infographics and make it more visual because uh, busy bosses and busy international development uh, representatives and directors, they need to get the uh, message very quickly by looking at some key graphs and icons. So be creative a little bit more and just put yourself into the shoe of the reader or the yeah. client. So I think that's it. Um, and if you have any question, maybe later on or how does it work, I don't know. But thank you very much. And I, I would be happy to answer any question when it comes to uh, the Q &A. Oh, great. Thank you, Mr. Tinchenli. So I, I hope our guys, you guys, um, uh, you have a very different background. So for, for example, uh, some of you guys maybe implement a project or work for the project. So I just, it, this, this information is very helpful for, for the people who implement the project, like understanding the very background and the general full process of evaluation that like, can help you guys to communicate with different stakeholders later on, yeah? Maybe with your donors and the decision makers. And maybe if you want to become an evaluator in the future, the, the, the information we just received was very fundamental. So I think uh, it was very informative for you guys. So, Thank you again, and um, let me check if we have the favorite here. Um, I think she's not here. Yet. Okay, so before moving to our next session, Let's take a break for five minutes. You can go to the restroom, drink water, etc. So let's meet back here after five minutes. At the end of the hour, you are going to have an increased understanding of both theory of change and logic models, and an increased capacity, hopefully, to develop a logic model on your own. But first, I'd really like to check in with each other. Um, I was, I know that there's a, quite a few people on, like 26 people or something, but maybe in the chat, you can just say, give me one word or two words that kind of describe what you're feeling right now. And I'll start, I'm feeling super excited. I, I really um, would, and can't wait to, to kind of delve into this with you. So if you wanted to just put how you're feeling right now in, in the chat box, and then maybe Flower, you or someone could uh, just read them out. Oh, relax, yeah. that's nice. Yeah. It, it's just... kind of late in your area, so I hope it's, it's uh, 
I hope it's not too late to get you excited about this. Okay, one Anybody of the else? one of these participants, Byra, said, I feel in a new chapter of my life. Wow. Hey. Anyone else want to share how they're feeling? <laughs> I agree. A lot of things to do. Yes. And also, Anurma Bhattar said, feeling like a lot of things to do. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Mm. Ola said, can't wait to have the explanation of logic model. Also, Piyamba said, be tired. And Ithim Jit said, and things to learn. Isn't Jim said, I feel so happy that young people are interested in evaluation. I agree. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. So before we can actually talk about a logic model, we really have to talk about a theory of change. And a theory of change explains how a group of early and intermediate accomplishments sets the stage for producing long-term results. Basically, it has three components. The first is the impact. What do you hope the program is gonna accomplish? The second are the strategies or what the program does to bring about those desired impacts. And the third are the connections how one result drives another or works in with another to contribute to a higher outcome. So every theory of change would have those three components to it. First, you need to know what it is you wanna change. So what's the problem or issue? Cause if there isn't one, there's, there's nothing to do, right? Yeah. Second is how do you think you're going to achieve or address that issue? And what do you believe has to happen in order to resolve that issue? So logic models are a graphical representation of that theory of exchange that we just discussed. They're a way of thinking, and it has just so many applications. I think you're going to really find them super useful. They come, it, you know, before you can design a program, you have to understand what you want to accomplish and how you plan to accomplish it and what all has to work together in order to make that happen. So they come first, it's part of your strategy before you can develop evaluation questions or, or evaluation plan, you have to have a theory of change and a logic model works so well. And I'll tell you, one of the best things about them is they help with stakeholders, they help with beneficiaries, they help identify all the things you need for a good program in order to be successful. And they're based on causal thinking if then. So let's just use as an example, attending this training as an example. If the planned activity is this workshop, then you will have attended that workshop. That's the specific output. You attend the workshop. You're going to learn the theory of change and then how to develop logic models. That's your first result, is that you're going to learn how to develop them. The next result, if you learn how to develop them, then you can use them. You can actually develop one and use it with your clients or your office or wherever. If you use them, then you will be able to identify the indicators of success. It'll help your ability to adapt to the program based on the results that you find and help you explain to stakeholders, funders, beneficiaries, the theory behind the change they expect. That's your goal. So let's take another example. This is um, an increased agricultural productivity is the goal. And you're working with small scale farmers to improve their planning methods. So if you design and deliver ag extension workshops on improved planning methods, that's your planned activity, right? If you deliver that the workshop, then the small scale farmers are trained on improved planning methods. If the small scale farmers are trained on improved planning methods, then they will have 
and improved knowledge and skills related to improved planning methods. If they have the improved knowledge and skills related to improved planning methods, then they can use those improved planning methods. If they use those improved planting methods, then they will increase their agricultural productivity. You can see how it's all causal thinking, if then statements that get you to your goal. There are some really important considerations about logic models. They represent what is supposed to happen according to your theory of change, but that's not necessarily what will happen. That's what you believe will happen, but not necessarily what will happen. And they appear linear, but theories of change rarely are. You, you have to go back. You have to do, you know, you're going to, for example, in that previous uh, example, you're going to need to do more than one workshop. You know, it's going to go back. People are going to learn, but they may not be able to implement it right then and there. So you're going to have to go back and do something else as well for them. So they appear linear because that's the way you have to put them on the paper. It's but they rarely are. And there are commonly multiple strategies within the same logic model. Now, I'm going to go back and just show you this really quickly. If this were all it took to increase agricultural productivity, deliver an ag extension workshop or multiple ag extension workshops in order to increase ag productivity, I think we would have a, a lot more agricultural productivity in the world, right? There's more that is needed. In fact, you need to have the right seeds. You need to have the right fertilizer if your soil isn't perfect or good enough. You need to teach them other things besides the improved planning methods. They might need equipment. They might need funding. That might be the bigger priority. And each one of those would have their own set of causal thinking. Again, the logic model has usually just within one logic model, you have these multiple strategies, which might be potentially hard to follow. Focus, the focus is definitely on the positive outputs and the outcomes. But as we all know, it's not always, everything is not, doesn't always work out the way you want it to. So you have to adapt and you have to change. And that is one of the things that you have to consider when you're using logic models that while this always just shows the positive outputs and outcomes, there's not always positive. Another good thing to learn is that there are many different ways in how they can look. And I'm gonna show you a couple of those different ways, but they're all, the idea is the causal thinking that goes along with it. And they can be a one-stop shop for stakeholders. Like it, it, you're gonna love when you have a one sheet of paper or one slide and you can show it to beneficiaries or you can show it to stakeholders, you can show it to funders and they're gonna be able to follow along and all your whole program is on that one sheet of paper. You're gonna, it's, it's just, people love it. So what are the components of a logic model? You have a program title, obviously, a situation statement. What is the issue? What's the environment in which the pro problem or issue exists from which you have to set these priorities? And then what are your priorities? As I mentioned, it might be that the priority is on uh, uh, techniques, planning methods in that previous example I had, but the, uh, the need might be also on funding. And so another group might say, okay, our priority is funding. So we're going to do a logic model on that. The desired goal and the that's the or the strategic objective, and they may or may not be the same. We'll talk about that in a minute. What are the inputs? What are the outputs? What are the outcomes, short, medium, and long term? What assumptions have you made? And what are some influences that can affect the success of the program? All of that goes into a logic model. So let's use an example of a, an educational support group. We're gonna create a, a situational statement, which is a succinct statement that answers these questions. What is the problem or issue? Why is it an issue? 
For whom is it an issue? Who has a stake in the issue? What do we know about the issue or the people? And what research or experience do we have? So that's a lot of questions. That's five, six questions, right? You can't fit all of that into one succinct statement, but you can put it in a way that is a logically organized statement so that people can understand what you're trying to do. So in this situation, example, this, the uh, statement is grade four school students are reading at a grade two level. If your cause, teachers re teach the science of reading skills and use the proper assessments, then students would learn foundational skills needed to meet grade four standards and increase literacy. So let's break that down. What is the problem or issue? Well, the problem is that grade four school students are reading at a grade two level. That's a problem. Why is it a problem? They're not meeting the literary, the literacy. They're not increasing their literacy. For whom is it an issue? The students. It's an issue because the students are not being able to read. Who has a stake in the issue? Well, the teachers have a stake in the issue because they're the ones who are teaching the students. What do we know about the issue or the people? Well, we know that there is science of reading skills and proper assessments that are currently not being used. What research or experience do we have? Well, the science of reading skills and the proper assessments would give the opportunity for the students to learn the foundational skills needed to meet those standards and increase their literacy. So while it's not in depth, it is succinct. And I believe you get the understanding of what the program is that you're trying to address. Now let's talk about the goal or the strategic objective. So what is it you want to achieve? And what is the highest level you think you can achieve with the time and the resources available to you? So that may, makes it different than necessarily the goal and the strategic objective being the same. In this case, the goal might be that your, uh, the students end up being great um, citizens of the world or citizens of their country or uh, find good jobs or whatever. That's a goal. That's a high level goal, right? The strategic objective is what can you actually do with the time and resources available to you? So that might be that the students achieve the literacy, increase in the literacy to the grade four. So that's the difference between a strategic objective and a goal. I prefer to use strategic objective because that's something that you're trying to achieve. But keep in mind that it may be different than the goal. So what conditions do you assume to be true for your theory of change or logic model to work as you intend? These are called the critical assumptions. And these conditions are outside of your control. So it's not like a critical assumption would not be that we conduct six workshops because you can control that. You can arrange for six workshops to happen. That's part of your project. It could be an example that's outside of your control is a change of government, which, would, which might mean that you cannot, no, they no longer have the same priority that the previous government had. You can't really control that. A war that would stop everybody from attending school. Weather conditions, can't get to school because the weather, you know, tsunami or something. A financial collapse, which would mean all priorities would change with the financial collapse. Funding and that beneficiaries receive the intervention. That might be a critical assumption that they are going to be there to attend the school, but you can't control that. So I want to walk through four different options, um, and different approaches to building logic models. And I think it's really important that you see how they could be done. And that also shows how different they can look. And all of the different ways are okay. The idea is that you end up 
with a logical progression of how things are going to be conducted, what you believe the theory of change is, and how the one result contributes to another result contributes to another result. Okay. The first step in virtually every logic model is to identify your long-term outcome of interest or your strategic objective. And then in this first option, you're gonna work backwards and you're gonna ask how. How can you achieve that long-term outcome? The next steps would be to identify who has to be involved, identify which activities, products, or events have to be undertaken, what resources are needed, what assumptions we've made, and what external factors outside of our control can affect our theory of change. Okay, so there's, a, again, logical steps as to how to create it in this case. We're going with the option one of starting with our long-term outcome first and then asking how. So this is an example of a results framework. We're gonna use for all four options, the improved literacy of grade four students. As I mentioned earlier, our strategic objective is improved literacy of grade four students. How would you achieve that? That's the first question. You don't have these boxes down here completed yet. The first thing you have is what is the, what's your strategic objective? So you have improved literacy of grade four students. How are you gonna do that? Well, by increasing their comprehension skills. If they can comprehend better, their literacy goes up. But how are you gonna do that? Well, you're gonna improve teacher implementation of the appropriate teaching skills that will lead to the student comprehension skills being improved and then the literacy going up. But you're also gonna to have to increase dedicated class reading time. How are you gonna do that? Well, you're gonna improve teacher's knowledge of student literacy at grade level. So they may not know what, the, with the science of teaching reading skills, that they are teaching the right skills to the right students. And you're gonna have this continuous improvement of successful reading skills. How are you gonna do that? Well, you're going to increase your knowledge of the science of reading skills so that they, as the teachers understand more about what their students need in order to increase their literacy and their comprehension, they can apply it. You're gonna use the appropriate assessments because if they weren't using the data and breaking it down by the students in their classrooms, they might be teaching to the wrong classes, to the wrong students, to the wrong needs. So you find out what those appropriate assessments are and then you use them. And then you also increase your teacher collaboration. By learning from each other on what works or what doesn't work, you can improve your, you have more successful teaching skills. And with those first three, the knowledge of science of reading skills, the use of appropriate assessments and increased teacher collaboration, that will help teachers improve their knowledge of student literacy at their grade level and cause result in continuous improvement of successful teaching skills. If you have that, then you would have improved teacher implementation of those skills and you'd have increased dedicated class reading time based on the science of reading skills research that's been done. And you would, if you have that, then you're gonna have increased student comprehension skills. And if you have that, then that's gonna increase the literacy. So you would also include the situation statement and your critical assumptions in this case are that funding is available their leadership support the program because it will require a change in curriculum and that students attend the school and receive the intervention. So that's the first half. These are all results, but they don't tell you how to achieve those results. That comes in the logic model basic framework here. What are we going to invest? What are your inputs? What are your resources that you need? Well, you need funding. You need professional vendors, perhaps, who understand the science of reading. You need a revised curriculum to build in that 
the reading time. You need Zoom if you're going to teach by Zoom or you need in-class places to teach the teachers. You need a training venue. You need books, software, substitute teachers, time for the classroom reading, and facilitator for cross-district collaboration. Those are just some of the things that you would need. What are the activities that you're going to do? Well, first, you have to determine what skills are needed. You have to audit the current assessments. You have to choose the needed assessments that are different than what you had you been using, develop the appropriate interventions, uh, develop teacher teams, schedule and conduct regular teacher team meetings, revise your schedules, conduct teacher training, and then use the data. Who are you going to reach? You're going to reach the teachers. You need to reach out to the school administrators, the curriculum directors, the state education decision makers. What happens if you conduct these activities? Well, outputs are what are the direct things that happen? Teachers are going to learn new or improved literacy schools. Um, no, sorry, those are the outcomes. I, the teachers are going to learn new or improved literacy skills. They're going to implement the appropriate interventions. They're going to use the appropriate assessments. They're going to learn from each other. And students are going to receive additional reading time. As a result of those outcomes, which are changes in behavior, right? What are the medium term results? They're going to increase their effectiveness of teaching and students are going to increase their comprehension skills. The ultimate impact of that is that greater number of students are going to meet those literary, liter, literacy standards, excuse me. So you can see how it's a logical thing. The activities lead to the out the outputs are for example students teachers receive the training assessments are conducted interventions are developed and then the outcomes are the changes as we discussed the learning the implementing the using learning from each other receiving additional reading time so that's one example of a logic model you have your situation which i described in the previous slide situation statement and then you have your assumptions and external factors. I usually combine the two and that's your critical assumptions here. So you would find um, all the results from your results framework in this section over here, uh, the outcome section, and you would have your assumptions, your situation, your inputs and your outputs here. So that's one example. Of, of how to implement or create a logic model. I will tell you that this is actually uh, takes some, it takes some time for the people that you're gonna work with to understand how to put that together. It's um, not necessarily intuitive for a lot of people. So it takes a little more effort in my opinion to do that, but I love the results that you get and how you can then use those results to build everything else and, and refer back to for looking for indicators, et cetera. So, but there's another approach and that option two is to identify your long-term outcome first, which is true, you're gonna see in every option, that's the first thing you always do, but then you move to the activities column. People often have ideas about the activities they wanna undertake. So it's, it's a really comfortable place for people to start then write down what you plan to do and complete the chain of connections. So if you've done that, what's going to happen? And then what's going to happen from there? Identify, after that, you identify what inputs you're going to need. And then you list all the assumptions and then you list all the external factors outside of your control. So let's have a look at that. If the goal is the increased number of students who meet grade four literacy standards, and then you just go in there and you say, if you have a group of people and you say, okay, so how are we gonna do that? What activities do we need to do? Immediate, I've always found that people can come up with activities of what they wanna do. You know, they're all, we're gonna do training. We're gonna do, um, have conversations. We're gonna meet with each other. You know, we're gonna get trained. We're gonna have use the data. They'll come up with those activities. They usually can do that pretty quickly. 
And from there, it's then easier to say, okay, what, what are we going to get once we use that data to determine what skills are needed? Well, we're going to know what we need, where our weaknesses are. We're going to have these classroom audits. We're going to be able to create workshops that are addressing exactly what we need to do in order to improve their uh, comprehension. And we're going to use the data to do that. They can do that so much easier. Then you start with, the, you, once you have the activities, you know, an output, I get, um, I, I have a tendency to add the number of, it's already creating um, some sort of an indicator for you or a measure. If you say, use data to determine what skills are needed. Well, you have a list of skills that are needed as an output. You could use that and say how many, uh, skills that you have and then start creating your measurements how you're going to measure that through that but first you have to get to the output level so choose assessments that students need to learn the number of for instance assessments that the students need to learn the number of training sessions that are conducted or that need to be conducted how many teacher teams meet how often they meet those are the outputs the outcomes, again, changes in behavior. The teachers learn, the teachers implement, the teachers use, the teachers learn from each other, the students receive additional learning time. And then increased effectiveness of teaching and increased student comprehension skills. And you see down here, you have the outputs. This is what do we need in order to accomplish all this? And it's really, inputs are really, strongly related to the activities and the outputs. The outcomes come as a result of what you've done. A third option is probably one of my favorite because uh, it's a lot of brainstorming, but it's also pretty messy. And I find it uh, super useful. You get a lot of information, people working from each other, building on what you are doing from each other. So if you I, first, again, identify the long-term outcomes, then brainstorm all the things that you need that need to happen in order to reach those long-term income outcomes. So it may be activities, it may be other results, it may be other outcomes, it may be outputs. It doesn't matter, that's the beauty of the brainstorming process. So you do that, then you put these items into logical orders and then you can cluster activities into strategies. You can gather the items that represent the assumptions and any environmental factors, and then you can identify the resources needed. So let's, let's just kind of look at it that way. The first thing obviously, and always, is identify that long-term outcome. What do you wanna achieve, your North Star? And then you see it people together. And I want to emphasize the importance here that when you have a, uh, when you do develop a logic model, you would never develop a logic model on your own. You develop it with a lot of people who have an interest and knowledge in the problem or the issue or the program that you're trying to uh, implement. Get as many people into the room as possible. And then if you do it as a brainstorming session and you start with your long-term goal, we want to increase literacy uh, of grade four students. You just start with that and then you say, how can we do that? And you get an, uh, I, I tend to, you can use a blackboard, you could use an easel with a paper, you can, you can use your computer and put it on a screen, however you wanna do it. You just write down everything everybody says, everything. And they will, because that's how we think. And, and we don't think necessarily, first this is gonna happen and then this is gonna happen. We just start shouting out things and people from all different um, parts of it who have different interests in that program or problem or issue are going to have see different things than you do. So you put it all together and you have all that information coming at you and then you break it down into the strategies and what needs to happen and you test then the if then connections and while the people are in the room, you say, OK, so if you say this is going to happen. How, what's going to happen as a result of that? What's going to make that happen? You're testing those if-then connections right then. And then you can organize it into the different strategies. So 
one strategy might be in the leadership in the school might say, okay, we want to uh, implement and the, de develop these uh, teacher groups, this collaboration across the district or uh, across our region. So how are we gonna do that? That's one strategy, right? That's one part of it. And the other one's gonna say, okay, what kind of workshops do we need in order to get the teachers taught on this? Okay, that's a different one. Put that in a bucket with all the activities, with all the outputs that you think are gonna happen, with all the outcomes that you think are gonna happen. And then another one could be um, the, how are we gonna change the curriculum to make sure that they could get 30 minutes? How are we gonna use the data so that, so that we're sure that we're using the right data for the right students so that we can all, we can achieve that result? Those are the, that's what you would organize the different things and always test those connections. So it's a continuous process. And you could see what I mean about a logic model being very singular and linear. But in fact, as you do this, you can see how it's actually circular. The fourth approach is to identify the long-term outcome and then reverse the order so that from the outcome, you get the medium-term outcomes, the short-term outcomes, and then the outputs, and then the activities and the inputs are in the far right. So that looks like this. You would start with your goal or your strategic objective. Again, always first. Then when you talk about that. So again, it goes back to that. Well, how are you going to do that? Increased effectiveness of teaching and increased student comprehension skills. What are the short-term outcomes? What are the outputs? What are the activities? And what are the inputs? So in a way, this supports pretty well the results framework from the first option. These are four different options that I have just showed you they all end up with the same information. It's all in how you gather the data and it's in how you use the data and present the data that you've collected from this logic model, how you put it together, and also a little bit of how people think. As I said, I have found that the um, this one, I found it the most useful as an evaluator because I can, look at each of these results and say, okay, what indicators do we need for this? Okay, does this make logical sense that this, this will contribute to this? And are these all on the same line because you can do them concurrently and that they will result in these? And what are we missing? You, when you see a picture like this, you could see what's missing, but it's also very difficult for people to get if they are not already thinking along those lines. I've had a group of people, like 10, 12 people, and I'd say, okay, let's start with this. What, you know, we want to improve literacy of grade four students. How are we going to do that? And they immediately go to something else or they can't understand what a result is. And that's probably the biggest concern for me uh, with using this one is that they don't necessarily understand what a result is, a result. And we form them. You see, these are all past tense as if they have happened already. So if we have increased use of appropriate assessment, increased knowledge of science reading skills and increased teacher collaboration, then we can improve the teach, teacher knowledge, right? And then we can have improved implementation. So I find that really useful for me, especially as I build indicators, the, the logic model is good for people to see. And if you can get everything on one page, this is what you're gonna show your stakeholders and your pot potentially your beneficiaries, your funders. But the option two, when you, this one is probably the one that people relate to the best. You know, that you start with that goal. This is what we wanna do. What activities do we need in order to make that happen? And as I said before, they always have ideas of the activities they want to do. And that's fine. Write them down. If they can't show you, though, how those activities are contributing to one of your outcomes, then 
you have a strong argument for saying, okay, if it doesn't contribute to an outcome, why do you want to do it? You don't want to do something that's not necessary, that's going to cost you money, that just le it leads to a dead end. It all supports everything that you do needs to support the outcomes, okay? And then down here, the inputs. The third approach, as I said, I love this approach because I think you get the best, the richest data. It has a lot of people involved. And I, uh, again, for all of these, I strongly recommend that you, you get as many people in the room as possible who have an interest in it or knowledge in it or have background in it. Get them in there, get the information. It requires a lot more of you as a facilitator of this or as an evaluator. You're gonna pull this information together and you might take a couple different sessions in order to do it, but you're gonna have a really rich session multiple sessions with brainstorming and it energizes people. So that's a really good thing too about that. You develop these strategies, you say what needs to happen and people, again, they're gonna come up with all kinds of different things from all parts of a logic model that you then can put together and show them a draft. And then you ask the questions, if there is no um, causal effect, then you can ask those questions and they could modify it. It takes it might take a little bit longer, but I think you're going to find that that's a really helpful one. And then the last one is really just sort of visually different than a results framework, but it also gives you the exact the exact same things eventually. I find that if you show this version to teams, you may or may not get them to understand it because again, they always care the most about the activities. So I think having the activities over here where they're first reading or learning about it is probably, you know, reading it is what gets them the most is the hook. So my recommendation is to put inputs first, activities, outputs, short-term outcome, medium-term outcome, and the goal. Switch it around like I had in the first logic model. Okay, so we have a little time. If you would like, we can create a logic model with an everyday activity, either preparing a local dish or organizing a meeting. And I don't know if, uh, do we have time to do that or, do, or is there general interest in doing that? Yes. Okay. So collectively, uh, if there is a local dish that you prepare, a simple dish or relatively simple dish, or organize a meeting, let's pick one of those two. Organize, um, the, organize the meeting, please. Okay. Okay. So we're going to organize a meeting. I'm going to get out of the presentation mode and go back to, so I can put together, we're gonna to organize a meeting and I'm going to share the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, and it is organize a meeting. Okay. So I can't encourage you enough to really try and participate in this because I can't do it myself and you'll learn so much faster if you do it with me. So let's talk about what a situation statement might be. Why do we wanna organize a meeting? What is our goal in organizing the meeting? To share information. About why, why do we wanna share information? Uh, maybe to discuss about the company's business plan. And why do we need to do that? To reach a common agreement. I'm sorry, to do I'm what? I'm sorry, to do what? To reach a common um, understanding or agreement. Okay. okay. Is it is it company's business plan uh, to to solve some certain problem that we are facing? 
Or to increase the sale. Probably of maybe, money. yeah, probably decreasing the sale. Okay, so the problem is that sales are not increasing as desired. If sure, if, sure, that works. If we discuss the company's business plan, what are we going to know? What's going to happen? And we we might find out the steps that we that we need, need to take to increase our increase the number of sales. To change the marketing planning or uh okay, we can okay. identify new steps to take or change the marketing plan. Yeah, and maybe we need to find out the reasons behind the taste decrease. Okay. What were the reasons? Then we can identify what's not working. And identify new steps to take or change the marketing plan. Does that sound right? That sounds good to me. Sales are not sales are not increasing as desired. So if we discuss, we have the if, and we so we are, I'm assuming we are the company executives or we are the company um leadership or not just leadership, uh, it could be the marketing and sales departments well, that's who we would be uh we can identify what's not working and identify new steps to take or change the marketing plan okay that's a great situation statement i think it's very clear it says who who is doing what and what we plan what would our if then statement our theory of change is that if we change the, if we identify what's not working and identify new steps to change take or change the marketing plan that sales will increase Okay, our assumptions are that uh, I'll start that there's not a financial crisis. Anything else? There might be some changes in the human resource, the key staffs working on the sales. So you're assuming that there will be changes or that there will not be changes? There might be, it happened. Assuming that it might happen. There will be No, changes. no, it happened in the past, I'm assuming. Oh, there were changes, okay. So a critical assumption there is not a financial crisis. So that is in, not in the past, your critical assumptions are that in order to identify what's not working, new steps to take or change the marketing plan, that you will be able to increase sales. So it's a future looking um, assumption, not a past looking assumption. Yeah. So I, is there- I thought that we can, we're able to identify what's not working. We, do we would that be a critical assumption like do we know that we can identify what the problem is i don't think that's a critical assumption because that's something we can affect okay but it's 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 definitely an assumption it's part of the theory of change that we will be able to identify what is not working so yeah i would say that you would have leadership support for the change but you have leadership support. That's an iffy one too, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. But um, I'll put a question mark by that. And um, um, maybe, there's not a mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe change in customers' purchase behavior, meaning a uh, change in basket, sales okay, basket. That, the um so that's not a critical assumption either that is part part of what we'll look at in the 
as we go over the business plan and identify potential, pro well, identify what's not working. So that's a really good point and keep that in mind. The critical, um, a critical assumption is something that is outside of your control and that may affect your, you're assuming these are, this is the land, the environment that you're working in uh, and that that won't change. So like uh, in the case that the business is not going to collapse. Um, what about the, oh, I'm sorry. Remain study. The um, business, I'm sorry, say what? The foreign exchange rate remains, oh, excellent. remains, um, re re remains favorable or mm -hmm. um, that there's not a pandemic. Perfect. Okay, business. Um, exactly. No pandemic, uh, no financial um, currency. Uh, what, what, did, what was the thing you said, Beth? Uh, currency fluctuations. Currency fluctuations. Okay. I encourage everybody to kind of have a look at, do some research and a little bit of research into cr critical assumptions because they definitely can be confusing, but this is great for now. Okay, so the activities, what are we gonna do? Just, you. Um, what were the things that you said that we were gonna do? To make a survey from the customers. Survey, okay. Survey the customers. Analyze What's the very the first thing you said you were gonna do? Sales analysis. I'm sorry, say that again, I apologize. Um, sales analysis. Oh, good, sales analysis. Anybody else? We, we could have like scheduled meetings. Uh, there you go. Within, within staff members. Yep. And what else? Uh, maybe review the finance, review the financials. How are you, how are you, how are you, how are you I'm sorry. How are you going to identify what's not working? Not working? Sorry. Sorry. How, how, you how will you identify what's, what's, not, what's working? not working? Okay. I'm, Maybe we I'm, could I'm, review I'm, the sources or um, customer base. Or okay. sales okay. channels as well. So, so this just got this a lot. This just got a lot of organizing. Organizing. Your excuse me. Your voice is echoing. I don't understand why. Um, is it doing it now? No, it's okay. Okay, I'm gonna try and stay farther away. I think we're getting uh, away from what the organizing of the meeting was, but that's okay. Um, if we survey the customers, what are we going to know? What's going to be the result of that? So, oh, uh, actually, for our customers' ones, customers' demands, or need, I'd say. Needs, customer needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, an output would be how many surveys, for instance, do you do we need on this? Do you one survey for how many customers? You know, like um, survey conducted. Um, uh, survey from loyalty customers, not limited by the numbers. Loyalty customers, did you say? Yes. Survey, okay, loyalty customers. Identify customers. 
So survey conducted, okay. Um, so customers identified, survey conducted, um, oops. Uh, uh, maybe yeah. revised marketing plans. I'm sorry. Say that I, I'm. I I have to sit back because I'm echoing, but I, that makes it harder for me to hear. So I apologize for that. Could you repeat that? Review our marketing plans. Review. Mm. Okay. Okay. That's an idea. That's, uh, so I would need to. Um, marketing plans. Okay. Um, identifying key products which generates the most income. Perfect. Perfect. Those are uh, great. Sorry, I mean the last last point belongs to the output. Maybe key products identified. Okay. Yeah, from the sales analysis. Okay. Anything else? Identify what customers want to need. Maybe we mm, maybe we are quality, 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 quality so that we can find out whether the marketing was the problem or our product was. Okay, you went double on me that time, so do you know what I'm saying again? So in activity, we can ask about our product quality so that we can know about whether the, um, the problem that our sales were allowed was uh, in a marketing problem or the, our quality, product's quality. Excellent, okay. Okay, so that's, you, you saw how easy it is to come up with the activities. It, it people like it. It's it's an easy thing for everyone to think about different things that they can do. And one idea generates another idea. So activities are a great place to start and everyone seems very comfortable with that. The outputs really are a response. The customers are surveyed, you know, the customers are identified, meetings are conducted. And often in these outputs, um, you would you would then know, okay, how many meetings did we conduct? Did we conduct Three, did we conduct five? Do we need to conduct more? That's what's one of the advantages of having these outputs. You know, are, are we doing enough? Did we identify the key products? That's what you, the outputs will tell you. Okay, identify what the customers want or need. You, it, once you know that, then oh, you can, um, you would go to the next step and say, okay, now that we know what they want, or need, what do we need, you know, what's going to happen as a result of that, you're going to change then. And this is one of the limitations of, of a logic model is that once you know that you, you take another activity, right, you do something else to change that. So you might do product. Uh, for instance, you might uh, change your product line, or modify your product line. So the problem with that is that it's in the same column as the first thing you did. That's one of those limitations of it. But once you've modified your uh, product line, then you have a broader range of products available, right? And the outcome should be based on if you did, if you conducted the surveys, if you found out first of all, the customers that you want to key in on, and you've conducted the surveys, and you know what they prefer or what they want in the products, and you've changed it, you would then see in the initial outcome, you would see increased acceptance, for instance, 
acceptance of the new products increased uh, per, um, under uh, use or purchase of the new products. Um, as an example, okay. And then once you've done that, if they're increasing, that would increase your sales. You might have found that even though you've modified the product line, that's not necessarily working. So it's also a matter of maybe changing the price of the product. And so you might have to modify the price, right? If you do that, you may have um, more purchase, well, increased purchase because of that or increased sales because of that, or you might have the opposite, but in a logic model, which is what I was saying earlier, it usually focuses on just the positives without the negatives. So you would have to check that. And that's why you would have your indicators. You know, are we increasing our sales? And if that, then your bottom line are um, companies, companies more profitable. Or sales are increasing. Increased product sales. something along those lines. And then what you would need in order to do that is you set a survey with something you would need to have a uh, revised marketing plan, a uh, marketing, you need your survey, you need uh, your leadership, you need sales and marketing. You may need uh, research. Research department, right, to create new products. You might, uh, what are some other resources that you might Documents, need? official documents. Documents, right, right. You need a, a venue, venue for the meetings. Feel free to jump out if you need any, or not jump out, uh, jump in and sit, say other resources because uh, you can see there's a lot of stuff here. Mm -hmm. You would, another resource you would need is your customers, right? You probably need some funding. Anybody, anything else? Anybody have any ideas on that? Okay. Well, for the, what, 10 minutes we just did this, I think that what you created is a very doable, logical plan. And you see what, how difficult or how easy it was to work based on using the activities followed by the outputs, the outcomes, remember, change in behavior, so increased acceptance, increased purchase, increased product sales, companies more profitable, these critical assumptions, there's not a financial crisis, which would totally change all of that, right? There is leadership support so that you're gonna be able to create those products. The business isn't gonna collapse, so you can make those changes. Um, there's no pandemic where people stop buying anything and there's no currency fluctuation so that your products, your sales are not affected by currency exchanges, okay? So that's generally how you create a logic model. You just did it. And I think you should be really, really, really proud of, of what you've done and give you an idea. I hope that gave you an idea of what it is that you need to do if you want to create a logic model. Um, you could always email me if you have any questions. I can include my email and uh, I will actually just put it right here so you can. And I want to thank you all so much for letting me discuss with you logic models and the theory of change. And I hope if you have any questions, you feel free to ask. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing. Hey, Chris, thank you.
thank you very much. It was very helpful. And, and it was very practical that we did it on a sample. And on an example, that we can yeah. take with you is really like help, um, help to catch up the topic. And yeah, so the logic model is actually one of the key document, key framework of the project document. And I hope our participants get the best out of your PPT. And so now let's move to our next session, which is question and answer. And you guys, if you guys have a question, just unmute your mic and ask directly or you can write it in the chat. Let me check with the chat. I think I saw a question about... Mm, so I have a question. So first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity, for the learning opportunity. So uh, I actually, I have been working in the project for over five years, but uh, I'm really interested in Emily. But my question would be very uh, uh, simple. Uh, in Mongolian language, we translated both outcome and output as a result. But in your uh, explanation, this is uh, totally different. So um, I, my question is goes to Desu uh, Kotra. What's the outcome? What's the output? And then briefly also, what's the theory of the change? Thank you so much. Sure. They are different. And I think that uh, that's a really key component and actually a, oh, can be very difficult to grasp the difference between an outcome and an output. Uh, and some of them can qualify as both. So an output is the direct result of, of an activity or an action that you've taken, a meeting. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna conduct a meeting and then the output is we conducted a meeting or we're gonna conduct six meetings and the output is that we conducted six meetings or we conducted five meetings okay so those are those are something that are just easily quantifiable what happened whereas the students um learned or we developed um six new products that would also be an output right because it's a direct result of something that you actually did is an output right an outcome is the people looked uh, liked the products or the people purchased the products the people tried the products that's a, a change in behavior and and that distinct that's the big distinction it's a change in behavior or a change of belief or a change in activities they're doing something different as a result so the ag productivity example where they learned a new skill that's a change in behavior they an understanding right and then they applied the skill, that's an outcome as well. And they increased their productivity as a change in sort in the environment. So there are three different levels of outcomes and they progressively get higher. The theory of change is what you believe will happen by introducing an intervention into uh, a situation. So I believe that if we can teach grade four students these different science of skill, science reading skills, that they will be able to increase their comprehension and outcome. And if they can increase their comprehension, they will increase their literacy. So that is a the theory of change because we started with one thing and to achieve our end goal, we took these steps to do it. And in keeping in mind that it's often more, I, I can't think of a situation, well, the door is locked and I unlock the door would be a single intervention, but in most cases, they're more complex than just one thing. You know, it's, it's 
this has to happen and this has to happen and this has to happen. So in the case of the students, they also had to practice reading and the teachers had to learn new skills and they had to use data. So all of those things had to happen. That's part of your theory of change. And you can see why in that theory of change, it's important to outline what your assumptions are, what you believe the, um, the situation is because if, for instance, the government were not stable or they, they and, and it changed, and then in that grade four example literacy, the teachers no longer had the support. They pulled the money from the support, from the training. Those teachers wouldn't know it, or they didn't give them the data. They didn't want, think, they didn't want teachers to have the data. Then you couldn't accomplish that theory of change. That's why it's really important to have those critical assumptions as well. So I hope that helps. Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Uh, thank you so much for your great lesson. I think um, you got a very new and very innovative models that we, some of us never heard or some of us are learning. So. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And my question is, uh, is there any difference between logic model and logical framework? Because I didn't see any indicators and source of verifications. So is there any difference between those two? Yeah, there is. Um, and you've identified it. I, I think that, um, and Bev, feel free to jump in if you want to, but also, I would say that a, a logical framework does have um, more into it, does have the indicators, it does have the measures, and it uh, that's that's a, a big difference. I find that I would I like to include everything, and I've actually the the kind of a lot of the research says that even like on outputs, you would not say number of meetings held because that's too much of a measure. You really in a logic model, you just keep it as meetings conducted. And I like to have it in a bigger uh, collect connection between what your measures are and what your indicators are and, and what your, um, your, your logic model does. So yeah, it is, it's, a, it's a broader uh, logical framework is a broader thing. And that's, I, I, if I were to go into that, it would, it would have been a too long of a presentation and too confusing, I think. So I, I didn't. Um, the way that we teach this within the measurement and evaluation program is that we have um, theory of change logic models, and that's exactly what, what Sue has gone over today, is that theory of change logic model, which essentially is linking your inputs to your results. Um, and then we have what we call evaluation logic models, or what USA would call a logical framework, that has the theory of change as a basis but then uses a different format and also adds in those indicators and data sources. So it, it takes it a step further where you can use the evaluation logic model or the logical framework more for evaluation planning. Um, the, the first, the theory of change gives you that, that clear theory of change. I'll put in the chat, um, some of the resources we use in our classes that are available online. Let me just find some links if you can give me a couple of minutes. So anybody else, if you have any question, you can ask it. Uh, I remember we have also one question. It's it's a question to Ms. Um, for to the first session. The question was, what is the best tool to get evaluation survey from local people living in the same areas? in person. So mm -hmm. it's about getting survey from the countryside, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, Andarma. So uh, Mongolia is very, in terms of territory wise, we have huge land. So even though population is so few, like 3.5 million, the landscape, land itself is so huge. So data collection is very expensive when we do in person, but um, if it's a nomad person, it happens to be falling in the sample size, then we do not have 
any choice but to go and find that herder herder uh because um you know in order to, in, in, uh, to make sure the sample is a good representative uh, finding giving up to us um but during covid um we had to uh, employ some um cutting method which is computer telephone uh, interview but um like uh, nomads do not have the electricity or sometimes connection so um then we had to jump into the next uh household that's uh, closer to in that clustering of the sample so that's one way to deal with but the best methodology is to go and find that uh, herder uh, who is chosen in the sample but if it's not the sample it's more like a key informant or beneficiary interview as part of the evaluation process we also plan to visit that uh, some people uh, to have face-to-face -face, uh, in interview fox group discussion but make sure that we do have do no harm principle is employed some usually when it comes to children uh, we have to ask uh, consent of uh, parents mm -hmm. and if it's uh, more sensitive issues like gender-based violence we make sure that women is um, quest, uh, interviewed um, not next to the husband so there are many ways that we can be creative and be diligent to make sure that we really get the right answer from the right person. Thank you. Uh, question. Um, do you use like a, a, or could you use WhatsApp to collect data, survey data? Um, WhatsApp, uh, in terms of internet connectivity, we are quite well connected, but if it's a herdsman or in very uh, rural area, and Zoom okay. is very, very like a deep in the rural area, so um, it's not good connection there. So WhatsApp is uh, using internet connection, so not really uh, feasible when it comes to very deep rural area. Yeah, okay. Sorry, uh, thank you, Mr. Shinchimek. So meaning that you are taking the questionnaire in a paper format, right? And then interview like in person, and then you take a note on the question, etc. Yes. Uh, evaluation yeah. is usually um, we we develop these evaluation questionnaires, the key informant guide guideline, semi-structured guide guideline interview question, and. Uh, like uh, bringing up tablet in front of them is also not so good idea if it's a very meaningful conversation and evaluation uh, type of work. But if it's a nationwide survey, tablet is maybe okay or paper-based questionnaire. But if it's evaluation, usually we have limited a number of key informant interview or Fox group discussion. So it's more important to um, build a good uh, human relationship and gain trust uh, in a short amount of time. So, but uh, what I do sometimes is I ask uh, permission for recording uh, just to, for my own sake uh, to later on um, transcribe, but I ask the consent. So yeah, paper or like a listening with full attention is I think much more a proper uh, way for that. Yeah, to add that question, actually, the collecting data and getting survey from the people in the countryside is one of the way like challenging thing when you're doing evaluation because, like in the countryside, you you have to travel a lot of kilometers to visit only one household. Yeah, so it would be costful, and if if um. One of the experience or the practice that we use it for that case is that um, we, we can develop the questionnaire in a tablet and the tablet can offline can work offline. And when we when we back to the some center or hotel and get connected to the internet, we can upload the data into the real-time data collection program. That is what we use it to do in one of our evaluation. 
And also, so we have another question. Um, you can ask directly. It's, um, it happened that we have uh, someone from Senegal. Yeah, it, he's a Papa Atasik. You can ask directly if you have a question. Please, you raise the hand. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's Papa Adesek uh, from Senegal. So I have a question to ask. It is about the the, uh, the, the difference between uh, the effect and the impact in a project. And uh, my question is, uh, when do we should talk about impact in a project? And the other question is, is there a duration uh, for talking about also uh, the impact of a, a project? And the last is the difference between effect and impact. Can we talk about effect in the place of impact? Thank you. Um, so when we teach in, in our program impact, it, it, different evaluators are going to define terms differently. And uh, you know, from a purist perspective, if you will, when we measure impact, we need to show what would happen in the absence of the program. So we need to have a treatment and a control group. So think of it in terms of COVID vaccines. In order to show that a COVID vaccine was effective, we needed to have one group that got the vaccines and one group that did not. So the treatment group is the group that got the vaccines and the group that did not is the control group. And then we compare the data from both. So when we want to truly measure impact, we need to have that treatment and that control group, that two group design. Now there's lots and lots of different ways that you can do that treatment and control group. You might've heard of the pre and the post test. So you test the group before and you test the group after and you say, how have things changed? That's probably the weakest. It's not a very strong way to measure impact, but it is one way to measure impact. The strongest way to, re to measure impact is through a randomized control trial. But those are very expensive and very mm -hmm. difficult to run given the, the requirements of the data. Mm -hmm. I would say that the majority of work that I do as an evaluator is more along the lines of performance mm -hmm. evaluation. How is the program performing? Mm -hmm. Or maybe some of those loose impacts like the, um, the pre and the post-test design. I will put a link in the chat um, on a couple of different documents that explain the uh, performance and impact evaluation. You can look at it on a continuum where one side is performance, which is less expensive and more feasible in terms of data, but less statistically rigorous. And the other side of the continuum is impact evaluation which is less feasible, more expensive, but it is statistically rigorous. So you, your evaluation will fall somewhere along that continuum. I'll put some other resources in the chat that um, to, to uh, help support what I'm saying. Okay. 
Okay, so, so uh, the, 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 uh, the objective of discussion is sometime we are discussing as colleagues uh, in the place of impact or in the place of, of, of effect, they talk about impact. And I told them for my opinion, impact is if you implement the, 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 the project and you, you, you execute it and you have to wait uh, until 10 years or five years just to talk about the, the impact. You cannot see the impact just after the end of the project now. And then you can have some results, uh, a midterm result, or you have, can have effect at the moment. But at the right, uh, at the end of the, the project, you cannot talk about the impact. You, can, you, you have to wait until maybe five or 10 years before talking about uh, the, the, the impact. Okay, so ah, we are still in the things to get more information in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so if there is no more question, we can end now. And so before we end today's session, let's open. I want to ask everybody everyone to open their camera and uh, let's have a group photo. Our team member Togolder will have a few photo of us. Yeah, um, celebrate our first day. <laughs> um, before we begin our photo session, I think Sigma has a question. She is oh, raising her hand. Oh, okay, go ahead. I have some okay. had, uh, maybe had I can ask I can ask later directly so the time is almost late <laughs> so I think it's time to finish so okay so should we start our photo session yes okay. everyone please open your camera okay. please turn your cameras on everyone Oh, okay, is everyone ready? Please turn on your cameras if you haven't already. Okay, on on three, one, two, everyone smile. One, two, and three. Okay, if, I think we have everyone. It's done? Yeah. Okay, great. So thank you everyone. So before ending today's session, I'd like to remind you that our tomorrow session is our morning time. So please do not be confused that it's again the evening time because some of us already thought that it's uh, tomorrow evening. So it's not tomorrow evening, it's actually 9 a.m. in the morning will be time. So for tomorrow's session, we have uh, another two uh, topics. And uh, from the shared agenda, we have changed one of our speakers. So we will have Ms. Beverly Peters again tomorrow. She will introduce us as another session tomorrow. So. Yeah, let's let's meet again in around 10 or 12 hours. <laughs> so everyone, please have a good night or a good day and see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. See you in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all the secrets. <laughs>